Hello there, good morning, or indeed good afternoon, depending on where you're tuning in from. Hot off the back of DCD Data Center as a Service last week, thanks for being with us once again for the latest in our series of DCD Deep Dives, brought to you this week in conjunction with our partners at Bloom Energy. I'm Dan Loosemore, the CMO here at DCD, and I'm delighted to act as chairman for the next couple of hours today, where we will deep dive into all things next-gen data center, looking at ensuring resiliency and energy efficiency with lower costs and a new paradigm to explore for future data center builds. Uh, a reminder before we dive in that this is part of our Always On content and conference series this year. Uh, we've got a really busy calendar of virtual conferences across the next few, few months, all of which are free to attend. And beyond the sessions, also provide full access to our year-round networking platform, DCD Connect. Uh, we really feel like it's important to continue to bring the industry together at this challenging time. And the registration is free, so do go on and check out the conference calendar. There really is something for everybody. Or, of course, if you've missed any sessions, fear not. A reminder that everything is recorded and available on demand, including the featured presentation today. So you don't have to miss a thing. You can watch any of our conference or webinar sessions on demand, wherever and whenever you like. Just check out the on-demand tab on datacenterdynamics.com. That brings us on to today's featured presentation. Before we dive in, a few housekeeping items. As ever, we like these sessions to be as interactive as possible. You can ask questions at any time using the Q&A module on your console. We'll get through as many of them as we possibly can during today's broadcast. Uh, please do keep them coming in during the presentation. It's often the case that everyone waits for the last 15 minutes or so, and then we run out of time. So do keep them coming in. We'll get to as many as we can. Uh, also, you'll see some really useful linked resources on your consoles today. You can download any of those resources at any time during the broadcast. Uh, for a more informal conversation, we would also invite all of you on the line today to join our expert speakers for an interactive roundtable discussion at the end of the live broadcast today. This will allow you to have a follow-up chat. It's more intimate and a bit more interactive. Uh, using Zoom, a platform that many of us will be familiar with. The roundtable section of today's agenda is Chatham House Rules, and it's not broadcast live on DCD, so it gives you a bit more of an intimate setting to get any questions, burning questions for Pete or for Michael, our experts today, to make sure we're covering them off. So come and join us for the roundtable at the end of the session today. There is a link on your console. That being said, uh, I think we'll hand over to our experts for today's featured session. Thank you ever so much to Bloom Energy for hosting today. I welcome Michael Mashati, the Strategic Account Executive from the Bloom team. Uh, Michael, I'll hand over to yourself to get us underway today and to introduce uh, Peter, our other expert as well. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Dan. Good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are, and welcome to today's session, the Data Center Facility Reimagined. My name is Mike Mashadi, Strategic Account Executive at Bloom Energy, and I'll be your host for today's session and the Q&A roundtable afterwards. The following presentation is an educational session focused on a topic that everyone here cares about, reducing data center total cost of ownership. Today's presentation is a partner forward event with one of our best business partners, PTS Data Center Solutions. PTS has been involved in designing, building, and operating data centers for over 20 years. PTS has consulted, designed, and built data centers, Kaiser, the US Department of Energy, NASA, and many others. Today's speaker has a broad range of skills, spanning IT systems design, data center facility design built construction in workplace technologies. He is an accredited data center tiers designer and has been involved in the develop development of millions of square feet of data center and enterprise space since 1998. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce the president and founder of PTS Data Center Solutions, Pete Sacco. Hi everyone, I'm Pete Sacco. 
And uh, uh, thanks, Mike, for that introduction. And I know everyone is uh, very busy, and so I really appreciate your time today. I promise you that you're going to leave with some valuable information today, and hopefully uh, you're going to leave with at least a few ideas of how to rethink your data center. I've been the founder and president of PTS for 20 plus years now, just like Mike said, and I can honestly tell you that I'm just as passionate about improving data center design and operations today as when I started. A quick story as to where we're gonna go. Uh, there's a, an author out there, Simon Sinek, who wrote a book, Ask Your Why, about business. And, and so he, more recent book came out with the infinite game. And at first I didn't quite follow, you know, where he was going with this. But the premise is we're never stopped learning. Uh, we're never finished. You know, life is not a, a, a goal to achieve. It's an ongoing thing. And I don't think I understood it to get a little personal is I, I had a medical checkup and the doctor came to me with what I knew the message was. He goes, Pete, you're too heavy. And he goes, your problem isn't that you uh, don't, you can't lose weight. Your problem is you can't keep it off. And that's when I realized it's not a finite game. It isn't about achieving a goal and then moving on. It's about an infinite game moving on. And so what I challenge everyone today is to think about your data center strategy is never finished. It is a constant ongoing learning adventure. And what I hope to do is today to give you tools for you to consider. So in the next 30, 40 minutes or so, I'm gonna share with you a mountain of information. And I hope you find it useful. By the way, if you haven't noticed, I'm gonna talk fast and I'm gonna use my hands. I'm sorry, that's just my nature. And so, but don't worry, um, as Dan said, uh, we're gonna have a round table at the end and I hope to answer um, all of your questions. So first off, you have to know I'm a technology junkie. And I use this place on the screen. Uh, that's actually the PTS headquarters. I'm actually sitting down in the bottom right as we speak right now. Um, but I'm, you know, I use this as a proving ground to look to ways to leverage the latest technologies to make data centers better. And the data center facility reimagined presentation is a culmination of that vision. Today, I want to share with you a new way perhaps a better approach to designing and operating a data center. I hope to show you how we can reduce your capital cost to build a data center, reduce your operational cost ongoing, uh, and at the same time, increase your data center's resiliency, improve its ease of use by reducing its onsite complexity and uh, giving you a very scalable solution that has, no, has little to no risk. So the first things that my clients came to me and we discussed was the market challenges. And so easily put, the first one was how do I balance my on-site versus my off-site, uh, on-site data center versus co-location versus cloud. And I have to do that um, in the face of a declining talent pool. And of course, the ever present budget constraints that were all pressed upon us. And uh, lastly, we have had a workload focused strategy that is focused on business outcome. And I will challenge that there's a better way to look at it. And so first of all, in the balanced approach of between your on-premise technologies and data center and your off-premise technologies, there's a number of parameters that have to be in considered. Their cost, performance, speed of deployment and ease of management. And the way we handle the people problem is by reducing complexity, not just in the data center facility, but perhaps even the IT systems as well. And then we have to learn how to retain that talent and train new talent. Well, in order to meet budget constraints, we need to minimize the CapEx, capital expense, cash going out of the organization, as well as minimize the operational expense, OPEX. You're gonna hear me use that throughout this uh, presentation. And we're gonna do that by using less infrastructure. In fact, how about we say this, how about we use the minimal amount of infrastructure we need in order to achieve the resilience that we want? And then finally, rather than a workload strategy, how about a data-centric workload strategy? One that considers, does that data-centric workload need to be autonomous to the rest of the organization? Does it have low latency? Does it have cost concerns, security, application performance, platform reliability? and of course, government regulations and government compliance. My solution can help you accommodate, uh, accomplish each one of these. 
So the first thing I want to give homage is the Digital Realty Trust because they came up with the Data Gravity Index, which simply put, basically says the amount of data that you have times the amount of data that it moves times the pipe, the bandwidth, divided by the latency will help you determine where is the place to put that data-centric workload. And if you're a math geek like me, you realize by the equation, latency becomes an important number because it's latency squared divided by all of those things. So latency is going to be one of the key attributes along with autonomy and security as to where you put a workload. So what is the evolving data center architecture? And again, gonna pay homage to a Digital Realty Trust who published this recently, but it was also um, definitely, I've been working with Gartner on the same thing. Um, if I draw your attention to the right side of the screen, we see it says at the edge, users, devices, and things. This is the point at which data is created. It is done by people, by business, by the internet of things. That data is created and used. And if it needs to be used autonomously, quickly, and, uh, and, and securely, perhaps the best place to put it is at the edge. Conversely, on the left side of your screen, we see the cloud in all its forms, right? And this is where elasticity happens. This is where platforms are and applications sit. And so, but the trick is that exchange data center in the middle, right? And so, of course, um, this could be a multi-tenant. This can be an enterprise regional data center. But its point is that it is housing data and its real purpose is to push data between the edge, that autonomous worksite, that high performing worksite and the cloud. And I would challenge that this evolving data center architecture is even becoming the standard for my clients that even have a cloud first strategy. They're starting now to realize it's cloud first as long as it is cloud capable, right? And so, uh, and, and cloud centric. So when I started working with my clients and we said, what should be the facility goals? They were clear. One, it needs to cost less to build. And not only that, it needs to cost less to operate that facility. And it needs to be deployed faster and it needs to perform better. Now these seems lofty, and, uh, but of course, and, and it doesn't seem like you can achieve all of them, but indeed, I realized, and if you remember nothing else from this presentation, remember what I said already, it is about using less infrastructure. And dare I say, use the minimal amount of supporting infrastructure needed to achieve your resiliency. If you do that, you improve all four simultaneously. One, you can design more quickly, right? If there's less things to put on paper, there's less interconnection between those things. And so therefore you could build some standardization and your designs could be adopted and adapted for the unique situation that your data center presents very quickly. Secondly, if there's less stuff and less interconnectivity, it can be built faster. Because remember, it's not just the things on the street uh, in, the, in the data center facility, it's the labor to build it and the coordination between all those trades to be able to do that. And so we can uh, drive labor costs down and drive costs down by using that less infrastructure. I'd also argue use modularity wherever possible. And again, without sacrificing um, any uptime. Third is make it energy efficient. And you're gonna see by using the two technologies I'm talking about, including the Bloom, they both drive down PUE. And not only that drive it down, but we're gonna operate with a PUE sub 1.1. And the design also will give you riskless expandability. The big danger in expanding data centers is always tying into existing critical systems. We're gonna show you how to uh, minimize that or, or, you know, or also eliminate that. Okay, so let's first have a discussion about data center facility costs. The, the equation, if you will, is a simple one. What's the cost of the land? What's the cost of the core and shell or base building, which by the way is about 100 to 200 bucks per square foot, right? And it's a real estate, so you could use a dollar per square foot. But then you have to make an important decision. What reliability do I want? Tier two, tier three, tier four, and I'm gonna use the Uptime Institute's vernacular throughout, right? So tier two, redundant systems, tier three, concurrently maintainable systems, tier four, fault tolerant systems. That model 
established long ago as two equations, the dollar per cost of the kilowatt or megawatt plus the dollar per square foot of the IT space. And then of course the cabling. What I'm gonna talk about in the blue is the cost of that infrastructure needed to achieve that resiliency, right? If you're a hyperscale guy, they're building in the range of about 10 to $12 million per megawatt. And if you're an enterprise service provider or an edge user, remember edge enterprise, but at the edge, which by the way, even in my, my, my clients in the pharmaceutical industry, their edge deployments in their labs are sometimes small, but can definitely achieve larger 100 kilowatt, even a megawatt size, because it is running the uh, data centric workloads that are on that local that require autonomy and security and performance. They're in the eight to $9 million per megawatt range in order to build that traditional design. And I can tell you over the hundreds of data centers that I've built and operated over my career, um, I, could, I, I, could, I see a correlation of the operating cost to the capital cost. And it's about 35 to 45% is what your ongoing um, operating cost is. What is the problem with the conventional design? The problem is that to achieve that $8 million to $12 million per square foot, which seems reasonable perhaps, it's front-loaded. And so if I'm building a 20 meg megawatt data center, I'm going to spend all of the money in the first few megawatts that I want to deploy. And then I get to spread that cost of that dollar over a very long period of time as I'm adding additional infrastructure or capability and or racks and, thing and critical load. And so that is not an optimal solution, even if we build using a conventional infrastructure, a, a scalable architecture. Here's what it looks like. And you know, I think of this as the opportunity cost of money, that big blue area, right? The big blue area is saying it's $170 million averaging an eight and a half million a megawatt. And in the data center facility reimagined, the light blue, I could scale in a much more linear process for a much lower dollar, about a 24% savings. But I think that that's not just the whole story. The story is by not having the massive, not zero, but not having the massive uplift in CapEx for the beginning of the facility, um, I do not have, uh, uh, I, I, there's a big opportunity cost of that dollar. So what does the data center reimagined according to me look like? Cutting to the chase, it's about six and a half million dollars per megawatt for a tier three, four, again, concurrently maintainable fault tolerant, fully embracing redundant systems, fully embracing multiple energy sources. Tier two is in the order of about four and a half megawatt. One main of four and a half million dollars per megawatt. One of the main features of mine is, and one of the problems when I designed traditionally was, I had to make a call as to whether I want to design a tier two or tier three or tier four, and to be able to scale with that, uh, the total design being either tier three or tier four or tier two. And I know it's perhaps a misuse of the Uptime Institute, but I could build different levels of resiliency and scale different levels of resiliency inside the same data center facility by how we architect it. And you will see how it becomes obvious how I do that. And again, because we're doing a lower capex, it correlates to the opex. And I'm gonna show these numbers later on. You're gonna get a lower operating cost and it's still about a 45, uh, 35 to 45% tie in back to the capex. Okay, so what does this mean if you're a hyperscale or data center builder, right? It means 35 to 45% lower capex and opex and it scales to 100 megawatts at any deployment density. Well, what if you're an enterprise or a service provider? And by service provider, I mean all of you. I mean the co-location providers in their many forms. I mean the managed services providers that are holistically building data centers and operating for a particular client. I see it very popular in the gaming industry, right? Um, and the telecommunications guys who are very much getting back into the data center game right now because of 5G and the proliferation of that. They will see less savings, but savings nonetheless, 30 to 40% is nothing to sneeze at. And they can accommodate higher inlet temperatures. Now I say that tongue in cheek, right? Because if you're an enterprise and you believe that I wanna operate as efficiently as possible to lower my operating cost, I can do that. But if you're a server service provider, you are offering not, not designing to science, you are designing to 
um, a perceived what is better, and that means colder temperatures. And so you, I get it. But here you'll have the flexibility to operate with any density with any inlet temperature you're looking for. And I think an important feature of the design is that you can stack a data center to put it in metropolitan areas. I'm going to show a case study later on of if I was to come to you and say, hey, you need to build a data center in downtown London because we need to get this as close to our users as possible. How would I find the land in downtown London to be able to do that? That would be a challenge conventionally. And then finally, for edge data centers, it's suitable for edge, but for loads that are in excess of 250 kW, if you're an edge guy. All right, so the two technologies we're going to focus on are Bloom Energy, who indeed is our sponsor um, and uh, a longtime partner of PTS, and we're very excited that at this juncture, um, and Xcool. And I'm going to show you how both of these have been used in the data center industry for the last decade. Um, but as far as I know, I'm the first guy that's gluing them together to make a holistic technology to make a complete data center that is going to serve the needs um, for the foreseeable future. So first, we'll talk about the bloom and power side. First of all, I want to point, that, point out that this is an operating data center. It's a 10 megawatt tier three data center, right? And I want to point out in the little gray shadowed area where it says legacy equipment, that is if we had built this as a traditional data center, that analysis was done. The black, where it's pointing to the black, and uh, the uh, bloom energy servers is what the actual resulting infrastructure was by putting it outside of the facility. And I want to make it clear, what Bloom Energy is doing is providing power to the complete A side for power and cooling. In fact, I'll take it a step further. The Bloom Energy server is made to service as much of the steady state load as is possible. So if you remember, and I'm going to use a little visual cue here, a facility will have some point of a peak, a bubble, if you will, depending on how it operates on a 24-hour day. And so in a people space, that's a very drastic, right? Because people enter the facility, or at least they used to, right? And then they leave the facility, and we saw um, a very high uh, peak to trough. In a data center facility, and by the way, many other facilities, hospitals, seven by 24 manufacturers, distribution, all the places where we're putting Bloom today, they have a very consistently high um, load. And then there's just slight peak depending on workloads and when they're operating. The Bloom server is basically grabbing that 100% of that steady state load. And we're gonna reserve that little extra bit to operate um, on electric utility, or can use other technologies, lithium ion battery storage, we could use uh, um, photovoltaic. In fact, that facility that you're looking at can detach from the grid completely using lithium ion and using a little bit of PV to knock off that uh, piece. But the important piece to hear is to realize that I'm, pu I'm pushing not just the critical load through here, not just the essential load, all of the air conditioning and fire protection and, and data suite lighting, I'm pushing all the loads, all of the lighting for the rest of the facility, all of the air conditioning for the rest of the facility, because I want to peek out the Bloom Energy server because that's where that is operating at a better price point than the utility, and it is operating at a better resiliency than the electric utility can provide. So in essence, you are going to have an electric utility sitting at the side of your building, which by the way, like the utility, you are not paying the CapEx for. You are paying for the design, the construction, the commissioning, and the ongoing maintenance for the life of your PPA. You're just paying uh, uh, the PPA agreement, your gas bill, and your electric bill. And in many, many states of the country, that will be um, a better price than the utility alone. You then add traditional generators and UPSs for, and diversity or PDUs for the tier, for the 2N portion of the load commensurate with the amount of load that you want. And I know that was a lot of talking about one picture, but we're gonna start to show pictures of it. But first, I wanna talk about the cooling side of this. And so on the cooling side of this, remember my premise, I need to use the least amount of infrastructure in order to achieve the resiliency, the redundancy, the maintainability that is needed. Well, how about getting rid of all of the chillers, 
all of the cooling towers, all of the multiple, multiple piping systems that I'm using, all the extra BMS points, all the electric, extra electrical work that is needed to distribute power to all of these operating things and reduce it down to a single box, a single box that will have multiple modes of operation from free cooling to DX air cool trim to adiabatic water and all of the different variations. I think there's six operating conditions that we can do, depending on where in the country you are, what your ambient condition is, you will reduce the complexity of the data center down to a single box. So what you're looking at, everywhere you see a red arrow and an orange arrow, that is a singular 250, and it's scalable in different sizes, 250 watt cooling module, and that's all you need. And by the way, you'll notice it's sitting outside the building, which is both it's good and the bad. Right? It makes it very hard to use in a retrofit situation, very easy to use in a greenfield situation. And what you're looking there, I think there's 11 of those. That would be 10 times 250 is 2.5 megawatts and plus one. Right? It's just that simple. And you'll notice that the way it's breathing is it's sucking the air in from the top by uh, consolidating all the hot air return. And there's lots of different configurations that could be used. I've put them in on roofs. I've put them outside. Um, I put them on, on, on the app inside, and you just need to be able to breathe. And remember, it's indirect, so the air streams never mix from inside to outside. This eyesore is the very complex electrical uh, one-line diagram for a one-megawatt design that's in process. And I'm putting it up there because I want to make a point. The green is what you would need for the Tier 2 part of the load. The blue is the only piece that you would add if you want 2N. In this particular design, I indeed am one megawatt, but the way it's designed is everything in the square box at the top, and again, I, I don't have a pointer that I can use, but everything that is below the utility service entrance in that dotted line box is the Bloom Energy server. I want to make it a point to say, you are not buying this. You are, in essence, doing this as an OPEX. Bloom is designing it, building it, deploying it, testing it, and then you're then using a 10, 15, 20-year instrument to pay for it, just like your utility. Below that box, you'll see some distribution boards, uh, four static switches, and then distribution. And that is where the 2N is happening. And I'm sizing the 2N in this particular design. Each one of those UPSs is a 500 kilowatt box that's tied back to um, each of the two separate data suites. We're gonna see a picture of it, I promise. Um, we're gonna see that. And then the generators to meet that need, which I could reduce the blue to as much or as little of the 2N load that I actually want. Here's what the simplified picture looks like, right? I take the electric utility, I'm running it uh, and, and, I'm, uh, and through a transformer and gas, and I'm running it into the Bloom Energy server, and that's serving the load 100% of the time. So let's remember that. That is an always on source of power, just like the electric grid, except it is gas. So if the, the, if the resiliency play is not obvious to you, we are introducing two separate always on energy sources, one electric, one gas with no common mode failure between each of them. So that's an important for all you resiliency guys out there. Very difficult to achieve in the traditional model. Very effective way to achieve in this model. By the way, the Bloom approach, very effective to put into an existing data center to make it resilient. The X-Cool, the IDEC, indir indirect evaporative cooling, not so easy to put into an existing data center. So think about your data centers right now. Would it benefit from having an alternate energy source that is potentially not just going to increase the resilience, but actually deliver it at a lower cost than what you're paying for your current utility bill? So the green halo that you're noticing on all of that is the primary power source. That's the 100% on energy source that's serving the load. The blue extra traditional support infrastructure is sitting in standby until it is absolutely needed. And so that's an important feature, which by the way, the contribution of PUE to the bloom is also a positive. 
I am not having the UPSs on and all of that distribution energized to carry 50% of the load like I would in a traditional 2N design. So therefore the losses, even though those manufacturers have done a great job in the last few years to minimize the amount of losses in those systems in idle and standby, we don't have any of them because your primary energy source is gonna be through the bloom, which is highly energy efficient. So your contribution to PUE is low. Here's what the picture looks like, by the way, for a one megawatt suite. So let's give you some landmarks. You would enter from the top, and that's just a common area. That's offices, and that's uh, uh, conference room suites, and meet me rooms, and Bob, you know, what, excuse me, not meet me rooms, but I, I should say all of the common things. You have a data center hall number one on your left hand side, data center hall on your right hand side. You'll notice how much of the cooling infrastructure is inside the room? Zero. It's all sitting outside the room. So the one on the left is a 500 kW operating load. You could sell that because it's operating with N plus one redundancy, three 250 kilowatt boxes. And by the way, it's scalable to turn it into a 750 N plus one. And so uh, that's a 500 kilowatt data hall number one, data hall or data suite number two is 500. There's your megawatt, which does have compartmentalized power rooms carrying the UPS in one room, but not in the other, but all of the switch gear. You'll notice off to the right-hand side, those are the generators, not in the picture, because I just couldn't fit it for scale, is where all the Bloom Energy servers would sit outside. And you'll notice I'm putting them on compartmentalized on opposite sides of the building, because what if you wanted to scale this design? The easiest way to do this is to either A, stack up, or B, Book match, book match, meaning, and you could see the kind of the grayed out uh, um, perforated lines, just flip the design on its short edge. Duplicate, duplicate the power rooms for power room number three, power room number four, duplicate to data suite number three, data suite number four, and then here's where the beauty of it comes. When I have to expand an electrical system, that typically is, cannot be done hot. So if I'm bringing additional UPSs on board, if I'm bringing new switch gear on board, I typically have to have some sort of a downtime, no matter how it was engineered to serve that. Another benefit of the Bloom system is I could bring on additional Bloom capacity into a hot live environment with no risk because the Blooms ramp up into the active load slowly and seamlessly with the entire stack. With that said, by the way, I have the flexibility to bring, or bring in a completely separate bloom under a separate PPA for my expanded role. The goal here is to not touch any of the critical infrastructure that is in place or any hot tie-ins, and that's how I'm redu reducing the risk. Which, by the way, you don't need to start with one megawatt. You could start with five, 10, 15, 20. I don't care what you want to start with, but we could expand in scale to that. I could have some expandability in the suite, some expandability by building adjacent data centers, in essence. They could be part of the same facility, but adjacent data centers. By the way, let's recall that the 2N infrastructure, the traditional infrastructure, is in standby. So if I'm going to expand my data center suite, or if I'm going to expand my data center with new suites and I don't want to build brand new infrastructure, new electric utility, new sets of switch gear, new sets of generators and UPS, and I only want to expand what I have, remember it's in standby. So with very little risk now, I could actually introduce and upgrade those systems um, as well. And that all lays into why um, it is basically uh, providing a riskless expandability. And remember, I've done this with less infrastructure, the minimal amount of infrastructure in, need in order to achieve that resiliency. Another key feature of this, by the way, is that you're gonna see it's about 20% less in-room physical infrastructure and supporting infrastructure needed. Less power, less UPS, is less all that stuff inside. A lot of it is outside, and by the way, even if you measure the inside to the outside equipment of a traditional design, we, I have 20% less supporting infrastructure. You know what that translates to? 20% more floor space to put racks. So you service providers, listen, that's revenue.
right? If I could expand my density, revenue. If I could expand my footprint, because you remember, my building is my building. I'm going to maximize that side. I'm going to use the outside in order to do all my air conditioning and power. I have more inside, 20% more inside to generate revenue with my footprint. So Bloom Energy experience has been done now in over 700 sites, not just data centers, by the way, that's everywhere. Like I mentioned, hospitals, manufacturing, distribution, food retailers, anybody that is looking for either A, resiliency to their power, like a data center, like manufacturing sometimes who are looking for that resiliency play. There's many different configurations for mission critical microgrid connectivities that we can do with the Bloom Energy server. And in many areas of the country, I can be price par with the local utility, meaning install the entire system, put it in the PPA, pay no more for the PPA plus gas plus remaining electric than you would have paid for your electric utility. And in other places of the country, I am sometimes substantially lower uh, than what your utility grade bill will be. So we actually introducing resiliency plus savings up to versus your utility bill. And it's an always on solution. Again, it's like having a utility, an electric utility sitting on the outside of your building, except it actually has greater resiliency than what the electric utility can actually deliver power. It has more nines of reliability to deliver the power at your edge than it is to have to, to trans, uh, uh, transform and distribute it to you. And, it re and, and then third feature is it generates electricity without combustion. It converts gas or biogas to electricity without smog forming pollutants. So if your company has made commitments to be greener, you can accomplish that goal while also achieving increased resiliency and potentially a lower operating cost for your data center or your hospital or so on. And by the way, the guys across the bottom are some of the people uh, that have used it in the data center arena already over the last decade. We're gonna see some of those. Here's Equinix, SV1 and SV10. You could see the original building and how it expanded. Um, you could see all the Bloom Energy servers on the outside of the building. In fact, it worked so well, you could see in the second building, they're using Bloom Plus, I believe that's PV on the top of the roof in order to even reduce its electric off of the grid and thereby reducing its cost further. Here is the same company, Equinix, doing a 1.2 megawatt data center. I put this up there. This is in San Jose, California, because you'll notice that this is on a roof. And you're saying, Pete, it's more expensive to put anything on the roof. You're right. However, remember, it's the Bloom system. So therefore, it's design, it's structural elements, it's construction, it's labor, it's commissioning is not a capex to the project. It is built into the PPA that you pay with your gas bill and your remaining small electric bill you're paying for it over time. In fact, I'd argue you wouldn't want to buy the Bloom Energy, even if you are a guy that says capital, because what you would never buy 20 years of your electric bill up front. You would, same way, would not want to do this with here. You're better off doing it. We are in an OPEX consumption world right now. Um, so you're consuming your power kind of like a cloud. Here's Kaiser Permanente's installation for a 4.75 uh, megawatt data center sitting in Napa, California. You can see the, some of the water storage for their cooling approach. And of course, if you need grapes, you got plenty of those. Um, I love this picture because this is Delmarva, a Delaware-based utility provider who found it less expensive to build out 30 megawatts of electricity using a gas feed through the Bloom servers in a microgrid application to deliver power to the people and businesses of Delaware. Nothing to do with data centers, but it's just talk. I think it speaks um, to the reliability capability of and where the system has been proliferated throughout the United States and the world. So again, here's another Equinix. That's a one megawatt installation, but I just want to um, uh, rehash some of the benefits here. Remember, this is an always on. It's a utility at your mission edge with no um, uh, uh, common mode failure between your uh, electric grid. I could build it. We can build it for mission critical reliability for your data center. You will have no downtime for maintenance. All of the maintenance is done on the system by the Bloom Energy team, as it's been doing for a decade. And you do not have any risk for failure for taking down or bringing up for the same reasons why it's not 
uh, harmful to bring a Bloom Energy server up. Um, it's not harmful to do maintenance on one at a time. And please ask us. We'd love to present to you the deep technical dive and the multitude of patents that are around this technology as to why it's capturing the world by storm right now. Just watch their stock performance if you don't believe me. And remember, this converts natural gas and biogas over to electricity without combustion. So for this is a green technology, low to no CO2, virtually no nitrous oxide, sulfur oxide, all of the oxides, you know, and, and no particulate emissions. You're getting 24 by 7 clean on-premise power. Okay, switch gears a little bit, and I'm going to talk about the cooling side and their experience for X-Cool. So they've been in business for 10 years. There's 29 clients. I will say that the majority of those right now, um, until next year, um, are in uh, Europe and Asia. There's currently 53 sites built, probably by many of you that I'm looking at the list that are in the crowd right now, um, because they're done probably 70% of the service provider industry, 30% to enterprise. There's over 1,000 units in the field and 250 megawatts of cooling. And remember when I challenged you early and I said, if you're going to build a data center in the, in the heart of London, where would you put it? How about 5,000 square foot building and just go up? That's telehealth, telehouse in North London. That is a 15 megawatt uh, data center that was installed scalably floor by floor starting in 2016. It uses 52 300 kilowatt X cool units. You could see a a picture of what it looks like right there. And you'll notice in the picture on the left, the green is the X-Cools lined up on the external of the you know, the building. And by the way, when this was done and Bloom wasn't as big, a big uh, an option, right? Could have easily put Bloom on the outside of this or on the roof and built that into the project, giving it either uh, even more scalability, reducing its capital costs, improving its PUE even lower by reducing, because I can tell you, this data center uses a very traditional N plus N arrangement for its power. Another one, here's Cyrus One, big customer of Xcool in, in, in Europe, multiple sites. This is a 15 megawatt data center using over 90 boxes built between 2017 and 18, um, and that's in Frankfurt, Germany. So why, um, of all the choices, and there, there are some good low, uh, there are some really good low PUE evaporative cooling solutions that I latch on to this. Because for me, the design checks all of the boxes. I could reduce my mechanical cooling to partial, depending on the operating condition, and it works directly with the adiabatic indirect cooling or without, um, or free cooling on the outside. Again, sized depending on the environment, place in the world that we put this. But it's got, it has low single points of failure, BMS points. It greatly reduces the complexity of the operating to a single box. So therefore my installation cost is down, my operating cost is low, my maintenance cost is low. It look, you can use little to no water, again, depending on where you are, and its restart time is really fast. And you have no potential for contaminant ingress into the data center floor which if you compare all of the cooling sections to the right, you'll notice something always kind of falls off the map. And so for me, it was the way I achieve the least amount of infrastructure. And I know I keep telling you that same thing in which to remember, if you remember nothing else, use the least amount of infrastructure you need to achieve your resiliency. Okay, operating costs. Oh, that's terrible. Why is that the case? All right, sorry. And so here is what the IDEC will look like operating in five major places of the United States, modeled with 10 cents a kilowatt hour, and I got it probably, uh, you know, not equivalent in some of those states, probably can get it for a little bit higher, or probably can't get it for a low, that low, probably have to get a higher lower. Regardless, everything is modeled at 10 cents, everything's modeled at about a dollar per 100 gallons. And you'll notice across the board, the operating cost of this is substantially lower than a chiller water system deployed. Here's what it looks like. I'm going to skip back to my one megawatt data center um, cooling approach now. This is the capital cost. On the left is the stack of buying and building chillers, cross, hydraulics, pumps, all of your additional electrical infrastructure and all of your BMS points approaching $1.2 million for you know, a megawatt install redundantly 
as opposed to $800,000, which by the way, they're building even more efficiently now. A typical 250 kilowatt box was selling for 175,000. We're, we're now installing them for 140 to 150,000 because they're getting more efficient um, at all of the manufacturing process. And as they bring on the South Carolina manufacturing and distribution solution, um, it'll get to the United States uh, even less. And so, but here built, or at least uh, budgeted, um, here it was an $800,000 build, substantially 24, 20 something percent less as a capital uh, a cost. Here's what it looks like for an operating cost. So again, some points. The orange is the electric utility, your highest portion of your uh, your operation and cost. And just for, um, uh, I, and then there's the maintenance cost. And then just for giggles, I threw in the staffing and taxes, and I'm doing that just to be uh, uh, funny with you. Because on the right, the light blue is the cost of, by the way, a very conservative 10-year PPA plus the gas cost. Remember, this could be even driven lower on an operational cost by using a 15-year instrument, using a 20-year instrument in which to pay your Bloom Energy system off along with its design, along with its construction, along with its going in operations. The orange on the right is the small amount of electric utility that is still required for the peak. And then you'll notice, although it's hard to tell, the maintenance on the right is a little bit lower uh, then the maintenance on the right, again, because we use less infrastructure, it's actually substantially lower. I kept the staffing the same, but I would argue because of the simplicity of operating the electrical and mechanical systems now, depending on your scale, think really large service provider and hyperscale, you probably are going to need less people in multiple shifts in order to service the needs of your supporting infrastructure. And so that results in minimum a 20% savings over a traditional ar architecture. Okay, so what benefits can you expect? And by the way, I'm almost done here. So I want you to start thinking about your questions that are going to come up, right, that you want answered, right? So I want to give you that, that, that five minute warning, if you will. And so, um, so think about those questions. We're gonna have that round table for uh, as much time as we need or some prescribed amount of time and, and Dan will bring us back. So what can you expect? You can expect to spend about six and a half million dollars per megawatt for a tier three, four architecture. I could combine that with a four and a half million dollar build, a tier two design. And by the way, any combination that you want from heavy tier two to heavy, you know, to heavy tier three or any mix in between. You can expect a 30 to 45% lower CapEx and OpEx on the overall build and operation of a data center built this way. And by the way, I'll build it faster because the design will be quicker. So we will have an easier transition to get build. And it's easier to operate. And as I mentioned earlier, you have 20% smaller support infrastructure footprint which is now predominantly outside the envelope of the building, which doesn't introduce further risk of having technicians that shouldn't be on the data center floor in the data center floor, which gives you greater capacity inside the building for the things that generate money, the IT and racks and cabinets. And you could deploy it at any density. I think one of the biggest attributes is I could deploy it in a multi-story, meaning it's suitable for a metropolitan area, because it is using external outside technologies um, for microgridding and indirect evaporation. So with that, if you're interested in a simpler data center, how to make your data center simpler, make it more cost effective, faster to build, easier to operate, I hope you reach out to me. There's my contact information. Um, I, want, I, can, I can help you establish a budget based on a conceptual design. I can be your architect, your engineer, your construction company for a turnkey uh, design. I would really love to be a part to contribute to the success you need in your next data center project. By the way, if you're an engineer out there or a construction company and you have a current design and you wanna compare it to this design, that's fine. PTS is actually um, the distributor for the, uh, the distrib a dis main distributor for Xcool all over. So we're plugging this into other people's designs all the time. 
Um, if you're a customer that doesn't have just a data center, but have other seven by 24 facilities, call us, let us bring, let me bring the Bloom team on site with you to discuss how we could give your building greater resiliency and perhaps reduce its overall operating cost below what your current utility is, bill is for your current utility costs. I want to thank you all for your time. I appreciate it. I hope to hear from you. Dan, we'll hand it back to you. Thank you ever so much, Pete. I uh, toured to Forbes in presenting prowess there. Uh, I'm going to let you catch your breath for a second uh, and bring Thank our you. host, Michael Rashati, back in. Uh, Michael, we've had loads of questions coming in from the audience, as you may expect. Um, a reminder to those of you that have emailed asking for the presentation, there is a copy in your resource widget on your console. You'll also be able to watch this session back on demand once we wrap up today. Uh, we're not going to get through all of these questions, so I'll also just put another plug in. There's a link in your console for the roundtable session. Click on that link just so you've got it ready in your browser now. As soon as we go off air on this broadcast, Pete, Michael, and myself are going to jump on that roundtable. Fear not, we will get through your questions today. Um, We'll ask a couple now before we run out of time for the main broadcast today. Michael, I'll come to you first to give Pete a bit of a rest. There's a lot of questions come in on the same theme around the rollout and, and scale up of, of PPA type agreements. Do you see these becoming commonplace? And, and if so, how do you see the role of the utility changing and what future collaboration with that utility may look like? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Dan. Um, you know, PPAs, power purchase agreements, are very prevalent in the energy industry today. Uh, I would say the vast majority of, of not only Bloom's business, but uh, the business in the energy industry is on a power purchase agreement basis. And it, it's, it's that way generally because that's what most CFOs pr prefer. When you buy a Bloom system outright, or a solar farm outright or a wind farm outright, it's akin to prepaying your electric bill. You're effectively capitalizing an operating expense. And while purchasing critical infrastructure that isn't always generating energy may be a, a valid way to execute those types of projects, by and large, CFOs and major organizations would prefer to pay for energy as an operating expense. And since Bloom operates seven by 24, 365, we fit that mold. And that's why over 90% of our business is via some type of power purchase agreement vehicle today. Thanks, Mark. I'm gonna uh, ask a related question before bringing Pete back in, which is a, a, a key pain point, particularly in these sort of post pandemic times has been around uh, forecasting capacity and the fluctuation in capacity demand there. The questions come in related to the flexibility in terms of scale up, depending on those capacity fluctuations. Maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, you know, in, in my previous life, and I'm sure Pete could speak to this as well, I built many data centers or designed many data centers What's a good analogy? Yeah, we, we built the stadiums for the Super Bowl to use a recent event, but the, the Super Bowl doesn't happen every week, right? It's a once a year event. Um, so what we've seen in the enterprise space and in many other verticals is a lot of stranded capacity from data centers built in the early 2000s. The Bloom Energy architecture, for many reasons, primarily one that it sits outside of the white space completely and uh, secondarily because of the modularity and the scalability of the architecture, enables customers to add critical capacity as the data center loads grow over time. Um, this enables you to right size the data center on day one from a critical power perspective. And if the rest of the load doesn't show up for whatever reason, you haven't wasted any money, any time, any effort. And to the extent that it does show up in the future, uh, Bloom has an incredible time to power. Uh, what I mean by time to power is we can deploy very, very rapidly. You know, early days in the pandemic, um, we actually set up a Bloom Energy microgrid at Arco Arena where the Sacramento Kings play 
to turn it into a pop-up tent hospital. Um, now, it only took us five days because we had a lot of leniency with respect to permits and interconnections and things like that. But it speaks to our ability to deliver critical, clean power quickly, generally much quicker than legacy solutions or the electric utility will be able to, 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 to bring solutions to the table. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Pete, I'm going to bring you back in. Plenty of questions there. A reminder, the slides sure. are available. Um, in terms of demand, you touched upon some of those cost comparisons at sort of tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four. Are you typically seeing demand coming in for tier four now? And how, how does that sort of vary by region? There's a few questions around the typical specs that, you, that you're being asked to respond to now. Yeah, it's, it's varying from client to client right now and uh, people chase the tiers. It's not as popular in the United States uh, to get the actual certification as it is uh, internationally. That's one trend that we see. Uh, the, the second, though, is in the functionality of the systems. Um, I would say early on, we were building much higher uh, grade facilities, tier three, tier four. Um, but the clients, especially amongst the service providers, um, didn't always fill those capacities with tier three, tier four willing to pay clients, which caused a, a point of consternation. And so uh, we found very many sites where that we, you know, we were designing uh, that ended up actually running out of space before running out of the power associated today. So, you know, a hallmark of the future design that I was looking for is how can I leverage so that the core of the technology was a tier two. Remember, 100% of the power flowing through the Bloom uh, 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 energy server, giving me that tier two. And then I could scale my tier three, tier four capability, delivering that two end protected load almost, I don't want to say an on-demand need, but I could surely build it in a smaller scale than I ever did before because the one thing that can't be predicted is how much will you need and so of tier three versus this. So if you start with a tier two design and you add tier three for capacity on an as needed or as expected basis, you have that flexibility. But from an enterprise standpoint, there is often upfront the need to have identified to say, I want tier three, tier four facilities, but we're also seeing a shift there as well. And you have to kind of understand the IT side we're seeing a shift away from the resiliency of just the data center to a resiliency in the software stack. So how could I push workloads? So whole different webinar, Dan, right? Whole different discussion to talk about how do we do that? And we are seeing different people latch on to different approaches, right? So um, how, how do we go after that stack? Are we virtualized or a hypervisor based, are we container based and so on? in order to create that resiliency at the software layer than just the uh, hardware layer. Thanks, Pete. Uh, we are rapidly running out of time on this live broadcast. A reminder for all of you still tuning in, and there's nearly 200 of you, uh, which I think is testament to the presenting skills of, of Michael and of Pete this afternoon, or today, I should say. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to move the conversation over to the open roundtable. Please follow the link in your console. You can click straight through to the Zoom. Um, it will be Chatham House Rules. We've got plenty of questions still to answer around sustainability, brownfield versus greenfield, and actually a few on workload advice, Pete, for where to place those workloads as well. So join us on the round table. Pete's going to jump on with us. Michael's going to jump on with us. And we'll have a, a bit more of an open, more intimate video chat. Um, please do come and do that. For those of you that can't join for that segment, just a massive thank you for tuning in once again and being part of the session today. A big, big thanks to Bloom for making it all possible and a massive, massive thank you to Pete for talking us through it. A reminder, it will be available on demand. Please don't panic if you want to revisit certain cost slides. We appreciate there was a lot of information there. Come and join us on the round table. Click through right now, because as soon as this broadcast finishes, the click through will disappear. If you haven't clicked through yet, please do so. 
Pete and Michael will join you on the other channel as soon as this broadcast ends. And a big thank you to all of you for tuning in. Thanks very much. Yeah, we'll yeah. see you on the other channel.